This program is brought to you by Emory University. When I grew up, I watched a lot of like like cable shows, like a lot of SpongeBob and like pro wrestling, actually. What the rock is cooking? Mariah Carey was like my inspiration. Old school, like hip hop and uh, R&B. Everything is different because of social media. We can get our message out there to more people quicker. I listen to Britney Spears and the Backstreet Boys, of course. My parents way totally misunderstand my generation. My parents would say it's fast. I have tattoos, nose rings and stuff, and like, she thinks we're just like the rejects. Eiffel 65, that was my first CD. I watched a lot of Golden Girls and Roseanne. I'm a big cartoon fan. I still watch cartoons. I watch SpongeBob almost every day. Social media, for sure, is, the, I think, the main thing that sets us apart. Privacy is gone on the internet. And it makes us very um, selfish in a way, too, I feel like. It's like always just about me, 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 you know? People compromise their privacy because they put so much stuff on the internet. Everyone's like glued to their phones, you know? Like, people just get, they don't know how to, human, like, to interact with people, you know? We have so many more outlets to be able to express ourselves and to be able to connect with each other. And I think that that makes us able to act on our own and have more of our own thoughts, but I also think it makes us more um, susceptible to conformity. The finding moments when the Spice Girls broke up. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> don't put that on there. This just in, we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. September 11th is probably the most memorable thing that happened um, in my lifetime. For my mom and dad, it was, you know, JFK and Martin Luther King, and I feel like this is kind of that cataclysmic event for this generation. I just remember watching the footage and seeing the entire country devastated. I became suddenly aware that there were all these other places that believed things differently than I did. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear. I would have to say Obama being elected. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. To me, when he was elected, it changed a lot of a lot of things. It's, it's not just, you know, a black kid can be a president or a, a black girl can be a president. It's anybody can be a president. Anybody can own a business. Anybody can do anything that they want to do. I think we kind of just have to work with what we got because that's how it is. Yeah, I mean, we can't go back in the past and change it. I think that they've led a really good path for us, but I think that it's up to us. Our generation isn't misunderstood. I think really, for the most part, we're the ones who are lost trying to figure out like who we are. You can't really blame it on anyone. I think that this generation will make our own mistakes and leave the next generation with problems also. This generation will help the world be open, more open-minded. We're incredibly passionate, but I think we have very short attention spans. I think that we can get on board with things really quickly and get really fired up and talk about it a lot and it lasts about a week to two weeks and then it's over. I think we're moving towards um, a new era where we're gonna fix these problems. I really, I really hope these important problems are gonna be fixed. We are the next uh, leaders. We're the next uh, business owners, people who create, uh, destroy. That's all up to us. What are you clapping for? I haven't done anything yet. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to see you. My name is Ali Velshi. I'm CNN's chief business correspondent uh, and uh, an anchor. And I want to welcome you to CNN Dialogues. It's a partnership between CNN, the James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference at Emory University, and the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. This is a series of forums that's designed to shed light on issues that affect our community and define our times. Uh, tonight's uh, discussion is about the millennial generation. Uh, you might call it mostly old farts talking about those crazy kids. But we're, uh, we're talking about, some of you are, in fact, how many millennials do we have in this room? Wow, all right, you crazy kids. Um, and some of you, does anybody here who manages millennials? All right, okay, good. So we got, we got a bunch of things. You guys, there, you're not as good at it. Um, maybe by the end of the evening we can get a wave going or something. Um, you might know them as Generation Y, basically a, a group of people who are uh, born sometime between 1982 and into the early 2000s, a group of young people who are starting to enter the workforce and in the, in the process are redefining the way we do business. 
Uh, as you saw in the opening video, uh, there are some preconceptions, which we, we're going to talk about tonight, but you might describe this young group as being hopeful, enthusiastic, and eager about the future. Uh, so tonight, we're going to discuss how this group is translating its habits into advantageous workplace skills, and for those of you who are managers of millennials or hoping to be, how multiple generations can, can work together effectively and you can get the most out of each other. Uh, you are all part of this conversation. Uh, for those of you who are millennials, this won't be new to you, but during the discussion, we're actually welcoming you to do as the millennials sitting to your sides would do, and they would use social media. You can tweet us. What's a great excuse for me to be on my phone the whole time? Um, you can tweet us uh, at, at CNN Dialogues, at CNN Dialogues, or you can tweet me, at Ali Velshi. And after we have a bit of our discussion, we're going to open up the floor to, to all of you for your questions and, and make them hard hitting. I, I actually tweeted, I've been tweeting all week that I'm going to do this, and I got a tweet. I, I needed to, I wanted to sort of reach out to some millennials, because I'm way too old to know any, um, about what life's like, what, what, what things they want to discuss. And somebody emailed me three hours ago and said, uh, life as a millennial is frustrating because I work hard and I have all these older people telling me I'm entitled. So we're going, to talk, ta we're going to tackle that a little bit, this whole issue of entitlement. It strikes me that all of our parents probably said the same thing about us at some point uh, or their, their generation. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to introduce uh, a remarkable panel. I, I have to tell you, uh, why, whatever reason brought you here, you are going to leave knowing a lot about uh, millennials and just sort of being better about, uh, about understanding their needs, hopefully. Uh, journalist Nadira Hira, who wrote the 2007 Fortune magazine cover story, You Raised Them, Now Manage Them, exploring how millennials will fit into the workforce. Nadira, welcome. Hi. Hi, guys. Demographer and historian Neil Howe, who actually coined the term millennial generation nearly two decades ago with his research partner. Brigadier General Lori Reynolds, Commanding General of the Marine Corps Eastern Recruiting Region at Paris Island, South Carolina. <laughs> Author Dev Aujla, who interviewed hundreds of millennials for his book to explore how to find job opportunities that allow them to make a difference while earning money. And Marion Saltzman, the CEO of Euro RSCG Worldwide PR and ER Life PR, who directly manages several dozen millennials in addition to researching the group for her clients. Welcome to all of you. I have to admit, I, I, I enjoy this. Uh, it's part of my job to to want to go out and, and, and learn things sort of firsthand from people. Uh, and we've actually done a great deal of in-depth study at CNN about millennials. We've, we've created a series on millennials. Uh, and I suppose, to some degree, we're all, we're all a little smarter about them uh, than we have been. I still don't fully have a handle on it. I don't have a handle on how this group of people identify with each other in their group more than my generation did. Uh, what defines them and, and who they are. And Neil, I'm going to ask you, because you literally wrote the book on it, but, but I, you know, I want to give you a little flavor, given that we're in the middle of an election cycle. Uh, my good friend Margaret Hoover, who is a uh, conservative commentator at CNN, has been, you know, she's written, written a book on millennials as well, and she's said uh, her her studies about this have said that they are overwhelmingly not Republican. Uh, they, there are, will be 65 million millennials eligible to vote in this election. If they turn out in the same percentage that they did in 2008, they will make up 24% of the electorate, uh, which is a voting block. Well, there you go. So turn out. Uh, a voting block more powerful than senior citizens. Who are these people? Uh, well, you're right about the numbers. Uh, we see about a 30 percentage point gap between 60 plus voting Republican and, and 30 minus voting Democrat. Uh, both this year and in the exit polls in 2008, this is the largest generational gap ever measured since the early 1960s when we did it. The only gap that came close was 1972, um, McGovern against Nixon. Uh, that, at that time, the under 30 generation were boomers. They almost broke even for Nixon, and Nixon, of course, vanquished every older age bracket 
in the fourth largest you know, electoral margin in American history. I, why, why he went into Watergate, we'll never know. <laughs> he didn't have to do it. Um, I, to understand millennials, you need to understand a generation's location in history. Every generation has it. You know, we all know the World War II generation. They came of age with the, with the New Deal in World War II and, and, and the Great Depression. The silent generation who came of age in the 1950s, the American high. Boomers, who were kids back then, have no memory of, of, of World War II. They came of age in the consciousness revolution, the, the huge social and cultural changes of the 60s and 70s. Generation X, born in the 60s and 70s, were the children of that era. They were the little kids of Woodstock, right? The little, little tykes. Uh, and they had probably the most wide open, underprotected uh, childhood of any generation born in the 20th century. You know, dazed and confused, right? <laughs> if you remember that. Um, and millennials are their location in history, is they're the generation that came along after that, after that whole period of family and social experimentation was over. In the early 1980s, we were suddenly into baby on board stickers and family values and cocooning and, and suddenly child safety products. You did them with rubber bands and, and, and cellophane back in the 70s. Suddenly, these were all gadgets you could buy at big stores fathers present at the birth of their children. So enor enormous changes occurred. Uh, and we predicted in our first book in 1991 that by the time millennials came of age, that they would hugely change uh, aggregate measures of behavior, that kids would become much more risk averse, they would become closer to their parents. Mean, now, at the time in 1991, everything about the youth culture was defined by Generation X. You know, everyone was into black and the murder rate was still going up and Kurt Cobain was still alive. No one predicted this, but we predicted this. These kids, once they moved into that new phase of life, would change what it meant to be a young person. And they have in civic engagement, for example, just to, you know, because you start out talking about the election. So. That's, that's one difference right there. You get to, by the way, respond to all of this. So if you agree or disagree or you want to be the one millennial who doesn't fit into any of this stuff, uh, please raise your hand uh, in a while. <laughs> um, Dev, you have written that uh, millennials, let me just tell you a little bit about millennials for those of you who don't know. Uh, they are the most educated generation in history. They are the most racially diverse. Uh, they are in debt. Uh, they don't seem to like criticism very much. Um, and they have the urge to share and be connected through social media, which, which then uh, sort of ends up making them feel that borders are not as, as, as firm and as, as clear as they used to be. Uh, they like pushing change through social media and the use of online campaigns. Uh, Dev, let me ask you about this. You have written that the millennial generation need to do good in the world coincides with their need to make money. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those sort of, it's, it's not a trade-off, you know? It's like my parents, and I guess the whole generation, but my parents in specifically, were like, you know, oh, you just need to get a job, and then, you know, you can become a philanthropist, and, you know, that's the way you do it, and you can, it's just going to work for you. And the truth is, it's like, I can't wait, because I see, all, and this is the same with all the people we talked with, but, you know, we see this, that hap not, not paying off for people. You know, it's not paying off for our parents' generation. They're like, they can't get out. They can't just become philanthropists all of a sudden. And especially what was really exciting about, like, when I started writing this book and talking to people was that people are doing both right now. They aren't having to compromise between making money and doing good. And in fact, a lot of the jobs where they're actually getting hired are at that hybrid space. And as soon as you sort of turn your head to that, and as soon as I started interviewing people, it's like, that's where the jobs are, in these jobs that are making money and doing good, and in these industries, like any industry you can think of, where you can rebuild, rethink, and redesign it in a way that does good. And I, I really believe that's the opportunity our millennial generation is taking up mm -hmm. in a way that's, you know, not entitled, but like really doing the work to make it happen. And 20-somethings have always wanted to do some version of that. It's just that the numbers of millennials that you have now coming into the workplace make it possible for companies to recognize that need. They have to adjust around these millions of people, and they don't have a choice. So now you can say, I'm coming to work for you, but you know what? Your brand has to mean something positive for me to invest in that brand. And so we're going to be in a partnership to do that. And we've sort of forced you <laughs> to, to make that shift. You're a financial journalist, as I am. Why in a... Uh, I don't like labels, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> you happen to be sitting in the chair next to me. Um, why in, a, in an environment like ours, where there's high unemployment, 
do these kids get to call the shots? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think when we look at recessions traditionally, this is true of uh, corporate America, it is the time at which you can make the most risky decision and take the least flack for that. So in, in a, in a kind, of, kind of counterintuitive way, I think it's freed us as millennials to kind of do things that people don't expect because, yeah, my degree costs $200,000, but everybody's unemployed. So if I want to go start a food truck in Manhattan, who's to say that's a bad idea? You know, and that, that is a reality. You actually have people who graduated with degrees from Yale and Stanford and Harvard running food trucks in the Lower East Side, and it's okay. Um, and so I think we're, we're allowed to do that in, an, in this environment in a way we haven't really been empowered to before. And by the way, our value systems are different. We've seen our parents commit so much time and energy and money to, putting, to creating a life for us, and yet we don't necessarily see the, the, the payoffs of that, the rewards, and so we sort of wanna, we wanna create some balance. The other thing is, too, in the corporate world, these are the most inexpensive employees we have, so we're gonna prepare to take the greatest risk with them, and they are in the best position to change us, change our values, um, change how we work, even what time we work. I mean, one of the things that we've had to institute is, for every week they want to give us back of their vacation time, we'll match it with a week to do social service. So there's no excuse for anybody in their 20s who works for us not to be out doing at least two weeks of social service a year because we give them too much vacation. They would, at that point, still have three weeks paid off, all the sick days they could need, and they could be off doing an important social service project for two weeks a year paid for by us. And they force us to do that because you, you lost one too many. Because, when you say they force us to do that, because you need them to come work for you, or you need their they energy are, or their they creativity? Are, they are the most skilled, inexpensive brain trust. Got it, that so that's your trade-off. Your right. trade-off is we want these highly skilled, well-educated, creative, cheap employees for now. Inexpensive. Inexpensive <laughs> for now. And in order to get them, it's kind of like how Google needs to make a you know, create a remarkable environment to work in in order to get the best engineers. You, that's your trade-off. You're giving them something. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and, and furthermore, we also know that because we're not paying them a lot, they'll churn through our employment or anybody else's employment, so we need to keep giving them that carrot. I know I can keep them for seven months if they can't do that social service thing for the first seven months. So I know I have them for nine months now. Retention is the key. Right, it's key all concept. about creating an environment where they actually want to be part of the environment. Vote with their feet. General Reynolds, uh, I, I'm very pleased you're here because you, uh, you bring a perspective to this discussion that really didn't occur to me, that the, the military has a remarkably uh, high proportion of millennials. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Absolutely. That's the, the active time that you'd be serving, um, the Marines in particular. Right. Uh, how do these themes that we've just discussed fit in with your job? Because you, you, you recruit for the military, there's a certain amount of everybody's got to do the same stuff in the military. So how do you blend these needs and these changes that are being called for by this generation with your recruitment needs? Well, well actually, you know, the needs of this generation fit very nicely with the needs of the service, especially today. Um, and I can speak specifically for the Marine Corps. We're getting more technical. Um, so we satisfy that need that they have to, to, to take technology to its, its extremes. There's a lot of things in the DOD where we are driving technology. We sell that. But I think on the intangible part of what the service offers to these kids, um, they are very service oriented. Um, they are used to having that parental oversight that we can help them with. <laughs> um, they, they, they want to be stimulated, and we can help them with that as well. So there's a, there's a pretty close kinship with this generation. Um, and, um, you, you know, DOD needs smarter, faster, sharper kids because of the way we operate. Um, you know, it's not uncommon at all um, in Afghanistan to see a young corporal who's got three years in the Marine Corps, alone and unafraid with his squad, taking care of business, dealing with the, the local chieftain, dealing, making decisions that impact all of us. And so you have to have an educated um, young man or woman to do that. Uh, Neil, give us a sense of, of um, you, you made a comment, Nadira, about uh, kids in their 20s have always wanted to do certain things. H how are how is this generation different in what they want to do? Uh, let's just address the, this entitlement issue. Are, are they, do, do, do earlier generations see this 
generation as more entitled than a previous generation saw mine? Uh, well, uh, of course they're entitled. They've been special all their lives. <laughs> That's part of the whole point, you know? That's why people had them. You know, they didn't, you know, millennials are the first generation that parents didn't have to have because it was no longer the conformist thing you had to do. You had to choose to have a millennial. In fact, we find one of the attributes about millennials is a much higher share of them were wanted at birth. Um, Look at that. Th Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> You're all so special. Well, this actually has direct management implications. Because, for instance, a supervisor, a manager, uh, not a manager, why don't we just say a coach? <laughs> okay? A nice word. Let's use this, a, a partner, okay, a senior partner. Um, I can't say you're not very special. Now, that's what a lot of Xers in their 40s want to say to you. Right. But they, they quickly learn that that backfires in their face. Instead, they have to learn to harness specialness, which you can do. You say something like, you're all very special, and we expect special things from you, right? That's how you do it. So you harness the specialness. Um, you, you've got to harness some um, specialness in the eyes of their parents. Now, every institution that millennials have gone through, parents have been a problem. So for the last 12 years, according to the MetLife survey, parents are teachers' number one problem in K through 12. And now they've invented, you know, Edline and Blackboard and all these things to get the parents involved. Because the, the teachers were straight-armed the parent, and of course then the parent became their worst enemy, so they couldn't do that. So now they do all this stuff to big, and the same thing happened uh, in colleges now. They have these huge onboarding, you know, where they bring the parents in for two days and all these boomers are, are, are clutching their teddy bears and crying and all that. And, <laughs> and, and then they, they make them sign covenants and contracts now. We, 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 you and I, we're raising this very special child. You keep doing these things. Let us do these things kind of gradually. It's like jujitsu. You don't stop parental energy. You just channel it, you know, around you. <laughs> uh, the same thing has happened in the military. I mean, look at uh, Erickson McCann, the phrase which has really caught on. Um, uh, you made them strong, we'll make them army strong. I mean, think about that. That's partnered. They get it. They get the partnership. And now these kids are coming into the workplace. So what are they doing? They're calling their mom and dad on the cell phone all the time. Why do you think they're so interested in benefits at a young age? Because their mom and dad are telling Forget them. You know, the cell to, phone. Mom and dad are supervising. You're supervising, but mom and dad are supervising on instant chat. Oftentimes, I'll find myself negotiating with someone and say, turn your dad off and listen to me. And it's because their dad is such a damn good negotiator. I can't keep up with their dad. I can go. beat them. It's hopeless. <laughs> well, uh, General Reynolds, we've got uh, a slide up there. Uh, which is the evolution on the extreme left? You've got uh, the, the, the you know the poster. We're all the iconic poster of recruitment to the U.S. Army and the evolution of of recruitment into the service over time. Tell us a little bit about this. So okay, so what what you see as you move from left to right here is um, you're moving from just talking directly to that young man or woman to oh, thank you, Ali. Um, here at the end, we spend a whole lot more time talking to influencers for these young men and women. Um, I have about 1,500 recruiters up and down the East Coast, and we teach them to talk to parents. So the first contact is with that young man or woman, mainly on Facebook or Twitter or however it is that we make contact. And the next thing is go set an appointment at the house with mom and dad, because if, if you don't teach mom and dad the value of coming into the service, than the chances of bringing that young man or woman in. And in the Marine Corps especially, we, we talk about, you know, you, you recruit the Marine, you retain the family. Um, and we're very big on that. And, and um, you know, at Paris Island, we spend a lot of time with families at graduation to make sure that they understand what just happened with their young man or, or, or son or daughter. So that's what you see is there's a whole lot more appeal. We have websites that are specifically to answer questions of families where you never wouldn't, I've, as a major I recruited in Pennsylvania, uh, you still had to teach mom and dad, but you were really talking to that, that young, um, the young man or woman, and, and uh, uh, once you sold him, then you taught him how to teach mom and dad. But now my recruiters have to go into the home, and they have to talk, sit down with mom and dad, grandmom, granddad, I mean, the, wow. everybody's involved. So. Nadira, tell me about the special thing. 
this, this uh, being special, this management of entitled, the idea, as Neil said, that, that this generation has reason to feel special. How do you manage that? Well, well, it's interesting. I think the first thing to recognize is that parents are complicit in this problem. I often say the same person who is an indignant boomer boss in the office is an indulgent boomer parent at home. And you have to bridge that gap. They need to understand that they are the issue. Um, and in, in a lot of ways, and we see this you know, in Fortune, every 10 years you'd see the new entitled generation, the, new, the generation that's gonna change corporate America. And the things that people said about the boomers when they came into the office are exactly the same. Boomers are the original navel gazers, I mean, in reality. So it's not, it's not surprising to see them come into this, this role of parenting adults and feeling as though they are entitled to, to speak to their children three times a day because maybe they pay the cell phone bill. Or, you know, you should, really, you should be getting a raise, I'll call your boss and let him know that. <laughs> or, you know, or you need to switch jobs or whatever it might be. I mean, I am a grown up person and my mom, if she doesn't hear from me within a five hour span, is calling the cops and my best friend and wondering what's, what's happening to me. And part of that is that our parents are at a stage now where they're transitioning into a new phase of their lives. Many of them are divorced and it's specifically for boomer women, they're sort of on their own. They need us sometimes more than we need them. And so I think a lot of managing this generation's parents is helping the kid to let, to, to put the mom or dad in a box, you know, helping them to recognize it's okay to be close to your parents, but at a certain point for everybody's mental health, you have to let go. Um, and I think part of this will actually be when we start to have families. This generation has waited much longer, um, by and large, uh, to, have, to have families, to raise kids. And when you, when I think as a parent, you look at your young person and they're a parent themselves, perhaps that starts to shift the perspective. But to the extent that's not, that's not the case, our parents are a huge pain. I, I, think, I think actually you, you, you also employ another strategy, which is not to fight it, but use it. I mean, the parents are close to them, so use the parents. As, as General um, Reynolds was just saying. Well, for, well. Yeah, for example, uh, the, the New York Stock Exchange has a very interesting uh, uh, introduction program when they bring in a new employee who's in their early 20s. They have a half day where they bring the parent down with the kid, they take them through everything in the stock exchange, show how wonderful this place is to work, and by the end of the interview, the parent is turning to the kid, don't mess this up, yes, okay? So you, you, in other words, you enlist them. So I'm telling employers, have a bring your parent to work week. That's They're right. calling their parents every day anyway. Make them part of the circuit that you see. In other words, embrace it, don't fight it. And I think that you are going to find, over time, parents having a very different relationship. And, you know what, and what's wrong with this, by the way? You have a lot more millennials living at home. What's wrong with that? We have a hundred trillion dollars in unfunded Social Security and Medicare liabilities, and if there's one way we can alleviate that burden a little bit, it would be generations who are closer to each other, mm -hmm. living near each other, mm -hmm. living with each other. So I, I regard this as not failure to launch, yep. but a healthy thing. But I think the challenge is how we grow up out of that. As an employer and as a manager, it's great to use parents, but I think as a millennial myself, the challenge I face now is how to start to build some space, some, some space within which I can mature and grow up and learn some of these lessons, and how to help my mom transition through that as well. <laughs> Mary? <laughs> yeah, another aspect of this, and I think you touched on it, is adolescence is just lasting at least a decade so, longer. So yeah. people are coming out of college and university, and they still are really young because why should they rush to be old? Because let's face it, given the state of the economy, we're all going to be working to our 70s, 80s, maybe longer. So your 20s is maybe a disposable decade. So why do you owe it to me to treat me like I'm a meaningful employer when I might be the way I treated those babysitting jobs I had back in my team? So I think that we need to think about it very, very differently. I never hear a young woman, and we employ 60 odd people, mostly female, under the age of 20, talking about having a baby yet. In fact, there would be a real taboo if you proposed that until you were really into your early 30s. And I think that people are just doing things later. And so this decade might be all about experimentation. It's a different relationship with the parents. They're more like the parents that are letting you go babysit, taking their car. Mm -hmm. they're, they're getting married later, but they're not having kids much later. <laughs> As a, you know, let's, let's, you know. Def uh, marriage today for millennials is something you do after you're successful. 
<laughs> Whereas for us, it was something you did at the very beginning of a career, but when you had no success, it was a foundation for life. Mm. Now, not necessarily having kids, but getting married is something when you've actually established yourself professionally. Jeff? You know, I, like there's this, this idea that we're emerging adults or like that we're forever adolescents. Like, it really bugs me in some way because I don't think that's true. Like, I really just don't think that's true. And here's why. Here's like what we're doing and how we're building our careers looks really different mm -hmm. than the way our parents built our careers. And that difference is not called emerging adulthood. It's called like building our careers for today and for the kind of jobs that we're going to get, which are like these jobs that are rebuilding the way we do good in the world and rebuilding every industry. And like an example. Oh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I just heard a lot of words. Okay. What are you talking okay, about? Okay, so let me give you a story. <laughs> okay. Of like this girl that is a, she's 25 years old. She is a feminist oral historian. Mm -hmm. so. You know, we never would have heard, of, heard about that sort of field or maybe mm -hmm. not, like don't understand it. She comes home and she explains to her mom and her mom gives her a business card. Mm -hmm. And the business card says something along the like, Leslie, Leslie Bancroft, Vice President, Shareholder Communications. And it's like, you know what, you know, I think this is, this is the job for you. You know, this just, this just makes sense. It has nothing to do with feminist oral history. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the career path that you take to get there. The career path that you take to get there is totally nonlinear. You know, you're going to be taking an internship. You're going to be working at a company where you can learn something, real skill, that's going to feed that broader mission. You're going to be going from, like, Traveling abroad experience may actually be that skill that you picked up doing that may actually be what enables okay. you to get that job. Let, let's, this is interesting, and this is, I want to push a little bit on this, and, mm -hmm. and everybody will have something to say about this. Let's just understand this. We have not changed the needs of our workforce all that much that this loosey-goosey stuff you're talking about is going to work for everybody. <laughs> I, I get that that's cool and that it may be more acceptable to do it and there may be better support mechanisms around there, but we actually, we've, we've definitely evolved from a society where we made physical capital and sold it and exported it into a society where we need uh, human capital, and that's the, the, the service, the military service understands that. But we haven't evolved into a society where everybody can just do whatever they want and expect to have a career out of it. No, but here's, here's the deal. It's like, so people are uh, like applying for jobs, right. and there are other applying for jobs out there like, I have all mission, I just want to do good and yep. like hire me, but they have no skills. Right. Or there's a lot of people that are applying for jobs that are like, I don't want to sell toothpaste no more, but I want to do a good but they have no mission, right. you know? So what we're seeing is where people are learning those skills mm -hmm. is not necessarily just in universities. Mm -hmm. They're learning them on the job. They're learning them in these places like internships. They're learning them traveling abroad. And those are real skills they're learning. And those companies that are hiring them are hiring them for those skills. Mm -hmm. So it's just a where are you being educated? You know, where is that? Where are you being educated? Uh, General, I want to ask you about I want to just keep on this thread for a second. Does that apply to the, the military too? I think absolutely. I, I um, you know, w once you bring them into the service, and, and so I have a couple hats. I have the recruiting set hat, and then I also have the recruit depot set, which is the 12 and a half weeks at Paris Island where we give them a whole lot of tough love. So. <laughs> And I just—I I will just interrupt you for a second. I, I've got the numbers here. You probably have—I mean, you probably know them. But I just wanted to get have our audience understand how big a deal millennials are to the Marine Corps. Right. So, 79% so, of the Corps. Okay. Is 79%. Is 79%. Um, 66% are under the age of 26 years old. We are a very young service. Um, which is why recruiting is so very important to us because we are recreating ourselves every four years, in essence. Um, but, but I think what we have learned in the core is, is that these can be fine Marines. They can, um, num number one, the fact that they're uh, educated, number, number two, the fact that they have the support of their family in this career. Um, th they do thrive under the discipline um, that we give them in the core. They do thrive under the mission that we have, which is to go serve. We, we, they want to be part of a larger institution that means something. That's what we do. The Eagle Globe and Anchor, that's an iconic, uh, they, 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 they are coming to see us about that. So there's a whole lot good about this generation and, and they can be disciplined and they can be hardworking and, uh, and you know, they're making a huge difference out there for us. Neil, we, we talked about something backstage um, where 
uh, when I tweeted earlier in the week that we're having this session, this dialogue on managing millennials, I got somebody who tweeted back and said, managing is Orwellian and authoritative. I don't like the word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of brought that to you. Uh, and I was, I was actually a little surprised by your reaction. You don't seem to like the word either. Well, I, I was, earlier I said, let's talk about coaches or partners, right? Right, <laughs> right but to, implicitly I was trying that to made you think that we should, we, should, we should buy into the idea that managing is not the right thing. Look, I don't, I don't, think, I don't think people are going to care all that much about a word. Uh, you know, call it what you want. You can call it a supervisor, you can call it someone in charge, someone who has to make the decisions. Uh, but they, how, whatever they do, they have to understand what this, you know, what this generation is about. Uh, there are a couple other attributes, too, I think we should raise. Uh, one is, and, and uh, this is something we found in our own uh, uh, survey, because we've surveyed thousands and thousands for, for our clients, thousands of, of employees, and looked at you know, what people of different ages want out of work. And one of the things we find consistently coming up with millennials is the need for structure. Uh, which is, which is, I think, consistent. <laughs> right? And there you go. There you go. Um, to tell you, much more, 20 percentage points more likely than Xers or Boomers to want immediate feedback, uh, to, want, to want a 360 ment formal mentorship program. Uh, they want, they're more interested in 401k benefits, accident insurance, uh, tax prep assistance, relocation assistance than people in the 30s and 40s. Relocation is, they don't have families. Tax prep, they're filling out the short form. But my, my point is, is that they, although they objectively have less demand for these services, so what you're gonna see in a way is the emergence of the in loco parentis employer who is going to put a lot more emphasis on benefits than Xers who cashed all the benefits out. Xers are free agents. They wanted to do what they wanted themselves with the cash. And I think this is going to be a very, I, this is something to watch over the next uh, several years, because I think you're going to see uh, benefits and, and uh, uh, a little bit more handholding, a little bit more advice and counseling given to millennials about how to manage their lives and how to manage their careers uh, from the perfect, em perfect employer. You know, they all want to of the perfect employee. So th this is very helpful because you've, you've given us a bunch of things that are highly specific to those people in the audience who are managers. I'm, I'm going to send this to you, Marion, for a second. Uh, what do you do to the 45-year-old manager, 50-year-old manager, who, by the way, has had 45 or 50 years of a different way of thinking, right. who feels as entitled to their way of thinking as, as the employee does? Uh, and, and, and General Reynolds, I'd like your feedback on this as well. How do you convince them that your way of telling this new employee to do things the way you did them because that made you tough and that made you who you are is just not going to get the best out of them or do the best for you. How do you, what, so what's reverse the... reverse mentoring is, is such an important thing right now and it's the one way we know how to bridge the gap because these young people come in and they have skills that we don't have or most of us really don't have. They are effectively digital natives. And so they have something that's so profound to offer people who are over the age of 35 that partnering them, them up together where they can make and create a real relationship, they'll get over their prejudices. To me, it's not that different than the workplace I joined you know, 25 years ago where race and gender were still variables. Right. Today, race and gender are irrelevant. Age is the big barrier. The way to work around that, I think, is to create these partnerships where both sides are you know, one plus one equals four. And you've got to really marry them. The other thing is, hierarchies are going to go away. I mean, I agree with you more than you probably realize. I think we're going to, our workplaces are in a chaotic state of change, and they need to be. We're not farmers, but why do we work agrarian hours? And that's something millennials are forcing us to recognize straight away. Why do we go in when the sun rises and leave when the sun sets? Most people's biological clock really works better different hours than working to their own personal peak. And so, the conventional workplace is going to have to change because these people are able to work anywhere, anytime, because the keyboard lets them do it. 
But I think the beautiful thing is that millennial energy kind of trickles up. It's like yeah. a ray of sunshine, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, I will often go to, to offices where once they can, those generations who feel like they're in opposition because we position them that way, that way in the conversation, realize what millennials are really about. A lot of them want the same things. They've just never been empowered to have these kinds of conversations in the workplace before. So you actually see them being more excited to see these changes happening in the office that they've been felt trapped by in some ways um, than, than anybody would ever expect. The, the, I think the real burden that millennials face in the workplace is the student loan crisis. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that if there's one thing, their parents feel it's of you, the over 45s, they are feeling the pressure of their own school debt that they're incurring for their kids. These young people come in and this debt, when it hits them, it hits them like a jackhammer over the head. And I think that's actually the biggest crisis because people can't take personal risks because those loans are due every month and they kind of feel like it's in inevitable. It's death and taxes. It's now student loans, death and taxes. That's interesting. Thank you, Rance. Uh, yeah. General, let me ask you this. I, I mean, what I know uh, in detail about the military comes from popular culture. Uh, and, and I mean, our, and our that's drill. That's 100% correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, let me ask you this part. Those, though, I've never seen a warm, cuddly drill sergeant who you call a coach. Right. Um, how do you adapt to that? Right. Well, you'll be surprised at how much coaching goes on. I will say, by the way, that Reveille on Paris Island is at 04, and they seem to react very well to the way we do that. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it works, and for 12 and a half weeks, they're, they're up and at them pretty early. But um, we also put them to bed at, 20, at 8 o'clock at night, and they're ready for that too. But, um, you know, the one thing that I would say is um, we go through, and I, th and I think that leaders in the military now have had to adapt to this generation. So it used to be that you could give an order and that order would be obeyed or bad things would happen. This generation, you have to explain why. You, you have to have that discussion with them. You have to sit down with them. You have to say, no, this is why I need you to do this. At the end of the day, when the order is given, we expect the instant obedience. But if they know why, they will do anything in the world for you. And you have to be very careful what you ask them because they'll do it. They'll do it. Mm. Uh, in the same way, the way that we do training now. It used to be, it's you know, the big talking head on the screen, and we called that training. That's, that doesn't work for this generation. They want to sit in a small group. They want to talk it out. They want to give their thought. They want to hear your thought. Um, and at the end of the day, you reach a mutual conclusion about what you just talked about, and that's good training. That's the way you have to do it with these guys. Well, on that, to that point, uh, we do want to hear your thoughts, and I want to bring to the stage uh, Andrea Hershatter. Uh, she is a millennial expert, senior associate dean of the Goizeta Business School at Emory University, and she put together a survey uh, that was sent to all of you when you registered to attend tonight. She's going to tell us how you all responded when asked about workplace issues and to see what the differences are between the generations. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you very much. It's quite a pleasure to be part of such, even a small part of such a distinguished and expert panel. Um, in preparation for these dialogues, we did want to know a little bit about your workplace propensities. We were fortunate enough to get a very nice response, um, a little bit overrepresented by millennials, but in general, every Every member of this audience had an adequate chance to vent and to express their opinions. And as you saw in the video, um, one of the things that emerges first and foremost is millennials' um, favoritism of social media. And so one of the very first questions we asked was, if you got a positive career news, a promotion, a raise, how likely are you to post that on Facebook or Twitter? And not surprisingly, millennials were very, very likely to post it. Far over half of them um, said that they would immediately go to Facebook or Twitter. Uh, Gen Xers too, about 39% said that they would post. Boomers lagging by a significant percentage, only 6% would feel the need to share that news with the greater world. Um, we then looked a little more seriously at the kinds of things that motivate each generation, and um, maybe not surprisingly, given what you've heard here tonight, for every generation, the things that really, really matter, a positive work experience, uh, work environment, belief, overarching belief in the organization's goals, matter very much for each generation. Um, where we started to see a little bit of difference is that boomers don't really find much motivation in what their boss or supervisor thinks. Um, they perhaps don't care at all, and that, um, 
Generation X is less than half as likely as millennials to be motivated by the expectations of their coworkers, which maybe does not surprise the members of Generation X in the room. We did then look at um, what you wanted in a boss, and we gave you the chance to come up with three uh, criteria that really matter to you. Uh, for boomers, they thought that the most important thing that a boss would possess as a characteristic was to be a good advocate for his or her team. Right after that, they wanted somebody who was willing to make tough decisions and someone who was intelligent. Generation X also values intelligence um, and they value uh, good advocacy, but they entered a new and actually their most important criteria was that they wanted a boss who was an open communicator. Millennials were willing to drop out intelligence and drop out advocacy. <laughs> they were um, very interested in open communication and they added to that they wanted a boss who was flexible and straightforward and direct with them. That that's the sort of relationship that they look for in their supervisors. Then we went back to you and you asked uh, and asked you what criteria you use to evaluate your own work performance. And here we saw that each generation, again, evaluated performance by their own standards. Um, the things that emerged as interesting here really uh, had to do with boomers not caring at all what their supervisors think, um, half as likely as millennials and Gen Xers to care about um, supervisor feedback in evaluating work performance, but much more likely than millennials to care about clear metrics. Then we asked what was perhaps my favorite question, which is what are you worried about? What do you most fear when you're looking five years out? Boomers had a very uh, quick answer to that. They most fear not feeling intellectually challenged or stimulated. Generation uh, X agreed with that. That was actually their top choice as well, but they were also concerned about knowing what the next step should be. They were only about two-thirds as concerned with that. Millennials were concerned about a lot of things, so not one area rose to enormous uh, prevalence, but they most con were most concerned about not knowing the next steps. Not having a plan is what really worries millennials. And then following that, they are, f they are fearful about not being challenged, and they're also, interesting for their age, fearful about not being adequately compensated for the work that they do. We spent some time asking a series of questions, and thank you for filling them all out so carefully, about your workplace propensities. What are your styles? How much autonomy are you comfortable with? How much ambiguity? How much do you want direction and supervision? And as Mr. Howe shared with you, you answered right on point to his survey. Boomers, very comfortable with autonomy, very comfortable with ambiguity, low need for feedback. Millennials, exactly the opposite. A lot of feedback all the time is perhaps not enough, and ambiguity, not their favorite thing. They really like a lot of direction. Gen X emerges here as extraordinarily balanced, very comfortable working under conditions of uncertainty, and willing to seek supervisory direction and feedback, but not needing it quite the way that millennials need it. Finally, we asked some questions about locus of control. Locus of control is a psychological term that has to do with whether you believe you are the agent of the changes around you or whether stuff happens to you. So if you believe that success, for example, is caused by yourself, then you believe it's the result of your own abilities and efforts. It turns out every generation believes that success is caused by their own efforts, but millennials believe it just a little bit more than anybody else, and Gen Xers a little bit less. When you look at failure, things change quite a bit. Um, the baby boomers have never done anything that was their fault. They believe <laughs> that all failure is caused by chance or fate or powerful others, whereas both Generation X and, and Millennials are a little bit more internal on that with, um, again, Generation X being the most balanced in terms of internal and external locus of control. The very last thing we did was we gave you an open-ended opportunity to describe um, what you liked about other generations and what you found perhaps a little bit challenging. And we were able to come up with some words that um, 
were quite you know, appealing to many people in the generation. So here's what we have as a closing set of survey results. Boomers can be stubborn Luddites, that's people who don't know technology very well, but very capable, hardworking, and with very valuable experience. Gen X, you can be arrogant and aloof, but also really proactive, creative, and collaborative. Millennials, entitled and unprofessional, but also confident, determined, and extremely tech savvy. So I think the audience um, is right on point with the comments of the panelists, and thank you very much for the chance to present this. Andrea, results. thank you for thank that. You. That was excellent. <laughs> saying nothing of the Saying nothing of the study, and thank you for undertaking that. Uh, that was just from a presentation perspective. You got a lot of information there. I'm going to take some lessons for TV. Um, that was really helpful. I think that was great. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm already far more into this conversation than I thought I was going to be, and I was already thinking I'd be very into it. I, I, there, we could talk for several more hours. I do, given this need for feedback, want to open it up to you uh, to tell us whether you think we're on point, we're not on point. We did get your feedback that way, but I want to actually maybe get your questions or your comments. Um, and uh, Katie, tell me how we're doing this. Is, it, is there mics? Okay, we got a mic over there. One mic, is that correct? Okay, so we're gonna start over there in the second row. Yeah, you, the one who seems very excited that you're about to get the mic. Um, <laughs> Feel free to identify yourself however you want. I was going to ta say that you should say something, but Nadira says that uh, if you're one of these millennials, you don't want to have labels. Uh, my name's Anna Ruth, and um, I'm a typical millennial. I didn't like the oppression of a traditional workplace. Wait, are you so, the one who voodooed me? I did. Okay. I'm going to voodoo you. You tweeted a picture home. of my little bookmark. I know, and I told you that I was entitled to voodoo you if I wanted You were to. entitled to. There you go. <laughs> Welcome. Um, so anyway, I, uh, I started my own thing, um, and I have a question to kind of turn the table a little bit on the debate we've had tonight. How do millennials manage other millennials? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Who wants to take that? Dev? Well, I just like one thing that the general mentioned earlier was like the idea of doing those the circles and like having people contribute their opinions and share and come up to the solution together, even if it's sort of known a little bit before, is like exactly the same thing that I've seen happen in all these social good like for-profit companies and like that is uh, that just I could I guess it makes sense because you guys figured it out and it's like that's exactly what's going on at all these change.orgs and goods and purposes and every other solar company that's starting up is like this kind of like real team-based problem solving like figuring it out together type thing and it you know it's, it's amazing you know, I, I mean I have to say I've been really blown away impressed by how good they are collaborating with one another and how that good they are at allowing natural leaders to emerge to solve a problem versus having a hierarchy that says you're in charge. This sort of the whole idea of, I think, collaboration, a collective thinking, it just seems to come naturally to them. And I think if you give them the right key performance indicator, what this group has to produce, they'll solve it amongst themselves and they'll do it in a way that makes you very proud. Where you screw it up is when you insert some arrogant boomer who's gonna say, right, right, but I gotta leave, it's 4.45. You know, as soon as you add an old style insertion to it, it falls apart. I don't think millennials are at all good at managing boomers. It comes undone, fantastic with one another. I, yeah. oh, go for it. Well, <laughs> I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the emphasis on teamwork and, and always uh, leading through consensus. Uh, there, there's like, like any trait, there's a good side and a dark side to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as millennials grow older, I think we may see some of the dark side. Uh, back in the 90s, let me just tell you that the biggest problem, because that's when I first sort of dealt with these issues with employers, it, millennials weren't even on the scene. The big issue is Xers and boomers. Boomers are in their 40s and Xers are the new generation. And just to explain to you, it's not always the same issue with the rising generation. What boomers complained about Xers is completely different than today. We complained that these were uh, edgy free agents, mercenaries, always out for themselves. We never complained about they felt entitled. I mean, they were like feral. <laughs> There's like animals out there, you know. But the idea they were entitled, no one ever thought of Xers that way, you know. We just didn't want to meet them in a dark alley. <laughs> but, so it was a very different kind of generation. And, and they wanted to go their own, with that kind of individualism that came out actually in this survey. Uh, and, and so now, of course, 
uh, let me just give you a brief example because we followed uh, the, the uh, reports from, this was when we were working with the uh, US Naval Academy, but we looked at some of the incoming plebs and we had constant every year reports from when they interviewed the incoming plebs about what worried them most and what did they most want to do. And in the 90s and then late 90s, we had Gen Xers coming in and it was always the same. I want to be number one. You know, I want to prove that I'm the best, you know, and all that. And then finally, when we reached 1991, 2000, 2001, the answers were, I don't want to let anyone down. You know, I want to make sure I fit and serve my team. And that shift toward an orientation toward teamwork, I think is the single most unrecognized quality in this generation. Very interesting. But the challenge, I think, because I totally hear you, is that as we move forward, there comes a point at which leadership is a solitary activity. You're absolutely or right. Or it has to be. And I think it is very difficult for us to face that. And especially when we're doing it with our peers, it's difficult for us to say to them, you're wrong. Or maybe you need to be here at 8 a.m. because we start at 8 a.m. Or whatever the, whatever the realities are of your particular business. And I think that is a skill set we actually have to learn. We have to go and cultivate those skills actively. Learn how to face conflict, not over text or instant message. Um, learn how to talk to each other in a way that's constructive. And how to teach each other how to receive that criticism and process it well. Because that doesn't come naturally to us at all. And I think we're going to see that become more and more of a challenge as we advance. All right, let's. Uh, I let's just say, if I could just Alex. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, John. Just one more thing. You never want to tell the Marine no. Well, the, <laughs> see, nothing's my fault, Ali, by the way. I'm a boomer. But, um, <laughs> but that is a very smart, smart move. No, I just wanted to say, um, you know, one of the commodities that we teach in the core is leadership. And they come to be leaders. They want to know how to be a leader. And this is why I was talking earlier about. You used to be, it was a very authoritarian, and it still is. The hierarchy is the hierarchy. It has to be. Somebody's got to be in charge. Um, but, it, but it's the how you get to that point. I think now, by the time a young man or woman hits the rank of corporal or sergeant, his team knows that he rates to be there. And, and they understand that structure that we talked about. They, they thrive between the dark lines. They thrive between the dark lines. And so you gotta paint the lines dark on the left and the right side, and they understand if you're at the top of that line, you, you deserve to be there. And, uh, and that's what we've experienced here in the Corps. So I'm sorry. Very Thank different you. answers, and yet none inconsistent with each other. I, I, this, is, I, this is making my head spin. It's amazing. Let me go over here. We've got a question over here. Uh, right in the back row, there, Mike's on its way to you right now. Keep your hand up. There you go. Hi, thank you. I'm Molly Epstein, and I teach communication at Emory University. And I have a question for the general. I have watched how the military has used social media and the internet to keep families connected. Everywhere I turn, I see the Navy moms ads. And I know that that's changed the face of the Navy. But once you have your, your service members, I'm just searching for the right word there. Once you have your service members there, what types of controls do you have in place so that social media and electronic communication is used in an appropriate and safe way given the importance of what your, right. your people are doing? Right, so, so this is where social media is not your friend, right? So, um, you know, maybe it's not good for mom to know that her son is going on a patrol today. Maybe we don't really need for him or her to go out on Facebook and show pictures of where they are and who they're with. That, you know, we call that operational security, OPSEC. Um, that's, a, that's a bad thing to violate operational security. And so, uh, but there's very, it's very difficult to do that, quite honestly. Um, you really do have to appeal. This is, again, you got to tell them why. You just have to appeal to their sense of do the right thing here um, because number one, you got to take care of mom. She doesn't really need to know what you're doing every day. Keep in touch with her, you know, send her, send her the, the email once a week and so forth. Um, but she's stressed enough, she doesn't really need to know that you are exiting the forward operating base right now. Um, and so we struggle with that. But, but we have over the last five years really released control of um, our networks, I'm a communications officer, and that, that is to say I install the networks out in the operating forces. Um, um, my job is to provide that network, and right now those kids can get on there and they can 
get on Facebook and they can be in, you know, they're putting pictures on, they're putting, so, um, but you can't control that. Once it's out, it's out. Um, but, but what we do tell them is this, and this is appropriate, I think, for all the millennials, is, yeah, you have, you absolutely have the ability to uh, tweet every last thought that you have, but it's not without consequence. Um, and if you remember the last part of that, then maybe that stops you from having diarrhea of the brain. Um, <laughs> All right, right in the middle, third row, right, yeah, you, sir. There you go, yeah, keep your hand up so the mic knows where to go. There you go. My name's Ron Leopold, uh, clearly not a millennial myself, but uh, have done a lot of market research on generations in the workforce, looking at issues such as employee loyalty, employee benefits, and financial security. And when we talked to millennials, like they showed in the video, 9-11 was the, was the formative event. But the real event that we've seen that has really changed Generation Y from being Generation Y not to Generation Y bother is the great, the great financial collapse of this country and the world. In September, October of 2008, a lot of the endless pie-in-the-sky opportunity that all of us but especially younger Americans started facing, started really closing in. Today we're seeing TV commercials with Gen Y being featured as kids living in their parents' basement. So I'm wondering um, uh, what in, in, in your respect, it sounds like everybody up there has probably had some perspectives on Gen Y before the economic mm -hmm. collapse and afterwards. How has your view and, and, and what you've been seeing you've been talking about, what you've been thinking about in terms of the needs of Gen Y changed pre and post Great Recession? Great question. Thank you. Nadira, let me start with you because you, I want to know what your experience is. <laughs> well, this is something I experienced. I was living it, not just studying it, right? And I will say for, for me and actually for a lot of my cohort, um, it made us bolder. It made us a lot braver than we had been because for many of us going to the school our parents wanted, maybe, I mean, my degree's in poetry, so I didn't study what my parents wanted me to study. But, but you, you certainly had an expectation of success. And watching what happened, I thought, you know what? Like, it would have been awful to have a Lehman Mer like business card. Why in the world would I have wanted that? And everything that I had been suspicious of, all my suspicions were corroborated by that event. <laughs> and I think for a lot of my cohort, and I'll, I will admit these are high-performing folks. You know, they all had graduate degrees and they were doing really well, and they are the talent you would want to recruit to run your organization 20 years down the road. Those people, not a single one of them is doing what they went to school for. Mm. They have all taken that opportunity and said, you know what, bonds are gone now. My parents don't expect the prestige job. I don't need the huge salary because the model is no longer two houses and 10 cars and my kids have to go to expensive private schools. I can now have the life I want to live. And it's allowed us to redefine words that I think had become really, really shackling. Like it doesn't mean, to be an adult now doesn't mean you have to be sad. <laughs> to, to, to be professional, and I thought it was funny, unprofessional was on that list of millennial uh, qualities. To be professional doesn't mean you have to wear slacks to work, right? We are just allowed to. <laughs> We can wear jeans, um, but that allows us to sort of redefine some terms and be freer in a way that I don't think we could have been pre-recession. Mary? Yeah, there's one really big thing, though, and that is it's actually hitting for the first time this year. When home equity dried up, colleges were paid for now very, very differently with some pretty horrendous interest rates. So actually, a lot of the young people that want to go into what would formerly have been perceived as glamour or creative professions, they can't afford to because they're so deeply in debt and their interest rates are so high, and it's not the kind of loans that can roll over because they're private loans, and their parents had increasingly less strong credit as the markets fell apart and their debt to credit ratio fell apart. So what you're actually seeing is a generation is coming of age actually unable to afford to work in the jobs that are available to them or they wanted to work in. And it's one of the reasons why I think all these programs, whether it's, um, you know, Teach for America, Venture for America, they're phenomenally popular because they're good things to do and the right thing to do. They're also phenomenally popular because they allow you to defer your loans mm -hmm. 
and they give you a loan payment on the other side. And I think it's forcing us to completely rethink what's entry-level work. So as a formerly very popular entry-level employer, I now find myself coming up against two really, really big challenges. Number one, the For Americas. Everything that offers you a chance to defer your loans, I can't compete with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not able to defer your loans. Number two, I'm not going to be able to pay like Goldman Sachs mm -hmm or any of the investment banks. So if you were really a greedy capitalist and you were willing to do that, I can't compete with that. So I have to just find, so you're not getting that same talent and they're not coming to you with the same attitude. And it's, it's very broken. And, and the lo student loan crisis is the single worst thing that has ever happened to this country. And I think people are asleep at the wheel about the depth of the severity of what it's gonna do because it's gonna cause problems. For these young people, for these millennials, it's gonna be a 30 year noose around their neck. Mm -hmm. I want to take the next question from a millennial, please. Just keep your hand up if you're a millennial who wants to answer a question right over there. Yeah, keep your hand up right there, and Mike's on its way to you. I've uh, heard twice in this discussion this um, air of surprise that millennials want things like benefits or maybe compensation for running these corporate companies from the ground up. Why is that a shock? I, I mean, we feel like we're entitled because we deserve it. I mean, I've been in school. I know, he said that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm like, I'm not special because I, I pine for my youth and I don't live with my parents because I pine for my youth. I live with my parents because I don't have a job. Like, it, and she's right, you're absolutely right. Like the student loan crisis is huge, but I could pay off my student loans if I could just get a job. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that wasn't a question. It's okay. It's we don't need. It, it's, it doesn't need to be a question. Uh, Neil, talk to us about that. Um, well, it, it, it's interesting. Why millennials live with their parents? Uh, uh, it's, it's actually many things, and this was a trend we noticed actually long before the financial meltdown of 2008. Uh, that simply accelerated a trend that was already underway. The fact is. Millennials, as late teens and 20-somethings, get along better with their parents, according to surveys, than any generation of young people we've seen, and vastly better than in the late 60s and early 70s, when something like half of all boomer youth really hated their parents. I mean, they wanted to get out of the home. I mean, we counted the days until we'd have our driver's <laughs> license, and we counted the days in which we could move out. And uh, if they didn't move out first and go to Sun City, you know what I mean? I mean, that, that was the, so, so a very different relationship. For the first time, we are seeing uh, millennials who finally get good paying full-time jobs continue to live with their parents because financially it makes sense. So, so the, in other words, it's not just the economy. We don't just want to, it's like they're being driven solely by, by money. Um, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, the entitlement you, question the, is, the, is... The entitlement yeah, question I, I about think benefits... Well, you, you were saying, you're, well, why, why are we surprised? Yeah, why is it surprised? It's, it's, here's the surprise. Uh, it's not that you're getting the value from the employer. It's that you want them as benefits. Generation X spent 15, 20 years cashing everything out into these total rewards plans. They did not want their employer to be... Uh, to be uh, a paternalistic, you know, deciding what they wanted to do. They were free agents. If they wanted to retire, if they wanted to move, they were going to spend the money their own way. So it's not that you're not getting the money. You get the money either way. It's that this is a generation that actually prefers increasingly to get it in the form of benefits, which is basically the employer putting that money into a package or into something that's been pre-counseled, pre-tested, you know, pre it's, 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 it's in keeping with what we see, which is a declining propensity for personal risk-taking in life. Uh, and, and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying it's new. I what to... surprises people, I think, sorry, what surprises managers, to use that word, I think a lot of the times is that we'll talk about that. We would be in the interview and say, so this is what I would like to do. Here's this package my friend has. My mom said that I should ask you about X, Y, and Z. And 
that is like, whoa, <laughs> we're, not, we're not at that point yet. And it can really be off-putting um, as, a, as a person on one side of that conversation to meet somebody who's in their mid-20s, say, and already has that list when they're coming in to have that conversation with you. So for us, it's important to sort of manage the way we communicate um, in those conversations. And then they won't be surprised because they fundamentally get why those things are important. Did that go any distance toward addressing it? OK. Over there, yeah. Yeah, you with the one who thinks the mic's coming to you. <laughs> I know that wasn't very clear. Thank you. My name's um, Lauren Jarvis, and I was a women's studies major, and I've been an entrepreneur most of my career. And my question slash comment is, do you think that it's more that not so much millennials, we feel entitled or we think we can do anything, but we're kind of shifting from a goal-based ex existence to an experience-based one. And I ask that because before I started my company, I definitely had several jobs. And I feel like the lesson from this great recession is that there is no such thing as job security, so why should I go give my life to a company? Right. Mm -hmm. Very interesting question. Thank you. Dev? Yeah, I mean, I really believe it's sort of like the way that we're building our lives is we're taking one, we're going and taking a job because we want to learn something from there and have that experience and we want to parlay that into the next thing and like, you know, it's this constant like bouncing around that becomes like our nonlinear career paths that end up in a place and we don't have that myth, you know, we don't have the myth that that's going to pay off. That's why I feel like we feel so uncertain about everything is because that non, we don't have a myth telling us like, okay, go to law school, come out, this is what your life's going to look like, so you're going to be able to do X, Y, Z. And if we're like take position, taking this path where we're taking different experiences and bouncing around, and you know, there's not that same myth being like, it's going to be OK. But you know what I found when I started doing these interviews and you know, seeing all these people that are actually pursuing a nonlinear career path is like realizing you're on it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're in the middle of it mm -hmm. right now, and that it actually does pay off. Like, it actually turns into jobs and careers for us. But it just looks a lot different, and we don't have that story that makes us feel OK going through it. And I feel like that's why we feel so unknown or so in the wilderness right. at these moments. You don't realize you're on that, the journeys. Yeah. That we're already there. That's we're already in the middle of it all. Like, General, this is let me ask you this, though, because uh, you were saying you, you turn over a lot, and obviously you've got a, a, a young service. So, so not everybody's coming in to the service thinking they're going to retire right. uh, 40 years down the road. Right. So, so one of the things that we talk about when we recruit young men and women is um, is that life after the Marine Corps. I mean, we talk to them about that when we, before we bring them in. Um, one of the things that we say in the Marine Corps is that we want to return better citizens at the end of that enlist, whether they stay for four years or 24. Um, the, the benefits, again, of a four-year enlistment in the United States Marine Corps are both tangible and intangible. Um, there are, there are the goals that we give them during their enlistment, but then we are teaching them those life skills that they can go do whatever it is that they want to go do after that. And there's a lot to be said about that. And, and they're willing to give us those four years because they can see that at the end of it. Um, the Marine family is very, very tight, and it's not just those in uniform. And I think that they see that. It's that family-oriented teamwork that they want to become a part of, even out of uniform. But I think there's a real opportunity here for managers because experience is the goal. And sometimes companies get in stuck into this idea of you don't want to work at a company for 30 years, so we won't try at all. And the reality is the way enterprises are set up right now, I could work under the banner of one brand for 30 years and have a different job every two or three years. I was just going to say, I, was just gonna say, I think yeah. that's really the new normal that people yeah. are striving for. We can already see it. So if I think of as my oldest millennials are those people who are just on the cusp of 30 mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. I have a couple that have been with us for six or seven years. Now they've probably been in four or five different jobs, mm -hmm. maybe in two countries already. Yeah. Because just as you're getting bored, I have to seduce you with another um, country <laughs> or with another promotion. Um, and promotions, what's interesting is this is the first generation that doesn't actually often ask for money for promotions. Mm -hmm. They're usually asking for better quality experience mm -hmm. or tuition reimbursement. So we're discovering that the benefits package needs to be created to be entirely different than what it would have been in the past. So a 30, we, we provide, I think, a $3,500 tuition credit a year that you can spend as you want to. That's a much more valuable benefit to people maybe than just the cash, because if you are living at home, you're already broke, mm -hmm. 
your student loans have scraped you, this is your one chance to actually do something good for you. Um, travel is another benefit I think that employers have to provide and also the high tech equipment, mm -hmm. state of the art um, telephony, state of the art computing, mm -hmm. constant connectivity, we've got to provide those things as part of that basic experience. Let me ask, before we take the next question, I want to ask if there are any millennials in the room who uh, have an experience or a characterization of themselves that they think is different from what they've heard tonight. Is there anybody dying to say, you're not really, we haven't hit on something? Gentleman over there in the white shirt, keep your hand up, we're bringing a mic to you right now. Yeah, hi, I'm Derek Quindry. I'm from, I'm a sophomore at Emory University, but I was just wondering, or I'm talking about, it's different because you guys, I know it sounds bad when I say this, but there seems to be a stigma in our generation towards the military, and um, just, I know a lot of my friends, or a lot of people I know, they look at it as a bad experience, but the way you're talking, or all of you are talking is uh, we start later, we need experience, and we need the structure and all that. So why do you think it's not more popular? Because I'm, my family, we're not very, we're different because we're not very close like that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have my parents pushing me to do these things. But you, if the parents like cared about, or okay, that's bad. Uh, that's bad wording. But if the parents were so concerned about their future and they didn't want them to get into debt, the military, am I correct, helps you pay for your school, generally? Well, we give you a paycheck. But yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then you pay for your school. Yeah, no, yeah. There, there, is, uh, there are all kinds of educational opportunities in, in, in any of the, the services. I mean, we, we have to keep training you because of the technologies that we have and the way that, that it continues to evolve and so forth. So. Yeah. But that's an interesting, I, I think what you, you might be getting at is the fact that you're hearing that you were not instinctively thinking that you would be hearing from a general and uh, hearing something that seems particularly appealing to your generation. Right. Are you benefiting from that? Are you finding that there are people? Well, let me, let me give you an example of how we have responded to that kind of information. Because, yes, there is a, there is a part of this generation that says, I don't want that kind of structure in my life. Um, I don't want to join that service. I want to serve, but I don't want to join. Um, but, you know, uh, part of, I think, what we are up against in the military is a lack of fundamental knowledge about what the, the military does. So, for instance, if you look at the latest Marine Corps commercial, um, it, it talks about moving to the sound of chaos. Um, it doesn't talk about Afghanistan, Iraq, it doesn't do any, it talks about moving to the sound of chaos, and it talks about humanitarian assistance, it talks about um, uh, poverty relief and things of that nature, and, and some of those other things that these services do, and then it says, which way would you run? Um, but that's specifically, I think, to address the notion that you're talking about that says, I don't, want to jo I don't want to go to war. I don't believe in this war or that war or whatever. That's not my war. That's well, there are other things that the military does, and that's how we've had to respond to this, this notion, I think, that you're talking about. It's this very service-oriented um, uh, generation, and we're just trying to appeal to that service. One of the things that we found in <clears throat> looking long term at, at survey attitudes of young people on the military is that for a long time, uh, when we were just trying to get the volunteer army underway back in the 80s on into the 90s, uh, you know, the bad news was is a lot of these young people did not like authority, they didn't like the military, they didn't like, you know, even often things that even stood for our country. Uh, and and uh, uh, then after about the year 2000, a whole new message began to come out of the data, and it was kind of a good news, bad news message. The good news was, boy, these young people now, they really don't mind serving the country. They don't mind service. They, they think America's a probably a pretty good place. The problem is their parents no longer think that, okay? And now you have actually a real parental undertow. 20 years ago, most parents had served. Today, most parents have not served. And the fact that this generation is much closer to their parents means that parents are often a huge negative undertow for this generation. I, I often talk to 
uh, Paul Taylor, who's the head of Pew Foundation, you know, Pew Research, and they do a lot of surveys on this. And he has a nice, uh, he has a nice way of talking about it. He says, you know, in so many things, Millennials are a service generation. You look at community service, you look at how much they can engage in their uh, neighborhood and so on. But when it comes to the military, they're more of a thank you for your service generation, you know? I, don't wanna, I, I admire them, I thank them, I'm grateful, but I really don't want to do it myself. Right. I think what you're touching on really is a lack of information. Because as a group, we really respond to expertise. We, we want to Wikipedia everything and Google it and check all the tweets about it. And so when you consider that less than 1% of the population in the US now has served, what ends up happening is that we don't really know people who've served. We don't have a sense of what that experience mm -hmm. is really like. And so why in the world would we commit to something that we have no perspective on? And I think that's really what the general's talking about in terms of getting the message out and helping us to kind of frame that experience in a way that we feel like we can commit to. So between not having served and not maybe having parents who have served, your message ends up targeting both parents and a, and a broader message. Very mm -hmm. interesting discussion. Gentlemen in the third row with my haircut. <laughs> Got to get a bald man in every time, every session. My name's Courtney, and Ali, I wanted to address, I think, your question more directly. You're a much taller, more handsome <laughs> bald man now that you're standing up, but go ahead. Uh, I wanted to address your question a little bit more directly, I think, when you talk about people that are in the millennium generation that uh, feel like they're different. Um, I definitely feel like you guys have hit on the mark of with your with your research obviously it's, it's definitely founded on good grounds but the thing that I think that has been neglected is that we're all different you've you've categorized us into this thing and you called us millennials and you say this about us that about us I don't think anyone in here in, in my generation would be happy to be classified in that generation where boomers or generation X would be you know rah-rah about it we want to think about ourselves a little bit more differently uh, on an independent basis and also want to say something about the point about the military and, and when you see that they have structure, when you see that they have, that they have a, a direction, when you tell them, you gotta tell them the why. Uh, it would be interesting to see how your panel would be received by a group of corporate executives because a lot of times we're brought into a job, we're just a number in some cases, we've been brought in on some type of other pretense, and then we get behind the gate and we see it's totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Nadira made the point of, we, we live in the age of inf information, and it's, it's, it's accessible to us at any given time. If we want to know something, we can go find it out. So just tell us up front. Be up front with us. That's what I would encourage. I don't, I don't know, not necessarily a question, but just a, mm -hmm. a thought that I had as I think it's an, excellent, it's an excellent uh, observation you've made. Uh, it is hard to categorize an entire group of people. And I think what, what we've tried to do, and I think it's interesting, is that the experiences here bear some similarity to each other in their research, and then your research came up. And so there's some, there are some similarities within which, which uh, everybody can be a little bit different. But Paul, the, the, uh, uh, Neil, I'm sorry, the, the thing that struck me uh, about what this gentleman just said is we don't, we don't have a lot of corporate America represented here. Um, we, we know the companies that have done overwhelmingly well with millennials who have harnessed the creativity that, that Dev talked about. Uh, the, 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 the technology companies, for instance, who really say, this is an exception. We're not making an exception. This is how we're going to run our companies. What's the message? I mean, this is a, a, a managing millennials session. If somebody looks at this, looks it up on YouTube, what's the message to the big employers who are going to face challenges uh, in recruiting and retaining talent uh, to, to, to that question? Well, I, you know, there, there are always a lot of different kinds of people in any gender, in fact, in any social category. I don't know, you talk about race or income or nationality or anything. I mean, there are lots of different kinds of people. Uh, but I think that when you look at huge changes in the center of gravity of a generation, admitting that there's a variety, I mean, listen, back in the late 60s, uh, something like uh, four-fifths of college freshmen said the most important thing in life was to develop a meaningful philosophy of life. And about 20 years later, two-thirds said no, it was to be financially well off. Well, now that's a huge shift. Now, if you saw that in politics, you'd say that's a seismic shift. Now, there are old people, yeah, they're back in the late 60s, there were people who wanted to be financially well off. But I, I tell you, if you went to you know, go to a job interview with, with Dow Chemical, <laughs> maker of napalm, by the way, uh, you had a lot of explaining to do back in your dorm room. You were aware that you were in the minority. 
And the, the important thing about a generation is you may be in the majority or minority, but even if you're in the minority, you're aware of that fact. And that fact alone shapes you for the rest of your life because you have to live with these people. And one thing about a generation is you are fated to live with them the rest of your <laughs> life. You cannot get away from it, right? But I, I think that one other thing that's important is corporations that are doing really well with millennials are really um, doing well with millennials because they respect their contribution. So you're either on a growth trajectory because you figured out how to harness this intellect, their passion, and to build into your idiosyncrasies the individual idiosyncrasies that come along with being an always-on generation. Because that's the one thing I think you can't stereotype anything about this generation, but there's one thing that's factually accurate. They're always on. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a phone, there's always a computer, there's some mechanism for always being connected. And let me, let me just throw in one last point, and that is when in regard to corporate branding, I mean, I'm just quoting here from Universum Communications, they're a big corporate branding company, but they've been looking at the top choices, the top preferred uh, companies that you want to work for from graduating college seniors. And back in 1999, we're talking about Xers here, every single one was a for-profit company. Today, Five of the top ten are either government agencies or nonprofits, from Teach for America to the State Department to, you know, the UN and, and the FBI. And so, again, these are big changes. I mean, you're surveying everyone. Of course, there's everybody. But this is a shift. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a shift to the center of gravity. But Courtney, I think just to inject a note of hope here, um, all of us probably talk to corporate executives a lot of the time about this group of folks. And what I often see is that the companies you would expect to be the least progressive are actually the most progressive. UPS here in Atlanta or Ernst & Young in, in New York. You wouldn't think, oh my gosh, there's a company that's going to be really sexy to millennials, but they get that they have to make those adjustments and they're very proactive about it. So I think that shift of thinking in, at the leadership level is actually happening and, and you'll start to see the effects of that hopefully. Def yeah, I, I mean, I think the last generation got paid to sort of take things apart and our generation is going to get paid to put things back together. And <laughs> is whether it's in big corporations or in these startups or anything in between. Like, that's our job. Uh, I, this could go on for hours, but unfortunately we do have a time limit and we're, we're out of it. <laughs> but I'll say no to the millennials or the Marines. Okay, this is, a, this is really the last question. It's gonna be a good one, all right. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. I'd like to say to the general, you are very funny. Yeah, you're very entertaining. My Marines think so, too. Yeah, you are. <laughs> this naturally that. funny. Yeah. Um, my question is, my sister and I started a magazine um, not too long ago. Yeah, Cotton Candy Magazine, everybody. Look, online. Yeah, online. But anyway, um, what I'm having a hard time dealing with is, is that I want to do my magazine, but I also want to learn from like the baby boomer generation, because obviously they have resources that I don't have. I would like them to invest in my magazine, and I would also like to learn, you know, what they know. But I'm having a hard time dealing with um, them understanding me balancing my business and working for them at the same time. I feel like they feel somewhat intimidated. So even if I say I do want to work for you, but I don't want to give up what I'm doing over here, I find them intimidated, and which is odd to me that someone who's 25, 30 years my senior would be intimidated with something of mine that's really in the fledgling stages. So how do I get them not to be intimidated, to invest in me, to hire me, or to invest in my business? You're right. That was a good question. That was worth, uh, worth uh, staying a little longer for. You're a hirer and manager of millennials? Yeah, actually, I think it would make you more attractive to us. Um, we know we're, well, this is a commercial agreement when we hire someone. I'm hiring you for between 35 and 50 hours a week, and you have a lot of energy and a lot of other hours in your life, and I want you to be as engaged and interesting as possible. So I would not only be supportive, I'd be really supportive about what days of the week you were doing with it within reason. I'd be worried about any of these employers that didn't want to do that because they are not with it. A, a, good, a good employer like Google actually formally allocates a certain percentage of time for its millennial employees to work on their own projects. Yeah. So maybe there's a message there for you about your current, I don't you know. You don't want them as yeah. mentors really? if they don't fit <laughs> that want, model. <laughs> right, maybe, maybe they don't have as much to learn from as you think. You know. 
I know, generally, you're not going to be letting people run businesses on the side while they're in the service, so we'll just get there. Um, <laughs> not, not, not any time soon. All right. Uh, that was very good. Thank you for that. Uh, this is a, a strange situation I'm in, in that, A, I don't want it to end, uh, and B, I, I don't know who to thank more, our remarkable panelists or the, the sponsors and partners who brought this together, or you for your remarkable engagement in this. So a round of applause for everybody. Um, I, uh, I really have come away from this uh, really having learned a lot uh, and, and having had some stereotypes uh, addressed and, and, and shaken. So I appreciate that uh, from all of you, from our, our great panel. Uh, thank you for what you're doing. This is, uh, as you said, Neil, a seismic shift. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's good to have all of your insights into how we can manage this and how we can best uh, work out uh, fitting into the whole shift. So thanks to everybody. Uh, have a great evening. Please stay engaged with us. Uh, we'll keep on doing this. Come to the next uh, CNN Dialogues as well, and it's a pleasure to have you here. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.